Bible's an important book, but it's really long. Yeah, it's a collection of many books written over a long period of time, but altogether they tell one unified story. So, what's the story of the Bible? Well, it begins by introducing us to a beautiful mind, the author of all reality, a being called God. And he has the power to take the dark chaos of the uncreated world and bring about order and beauty and a garden full of life. And to crown this accomplishment, God appoints these creatures called humanity. Or in Hebrew, Adam. And they're made as God's image. Which means that they're commissioned to rule this beautiful world on God's behalf by harnessing all of its potential and creating even more beauty and order. This is a story about humans using their power to do meaningful, life-giving work. But the question is, how? Yeah, humanity now faces a choice that's represented by a fruit tree. So humans could partner with God and find freedom by trusting in his knowledge of good and evil. Or they could seize power and define good and evil on their own, which, God warns, will kill them. And they hear the voice of a dark, mysterious... Humanity, called Adam, so it's a, both a proper name in the Bible and a title, that's what it means, right? So Adam, lowercase, let's just say, means all humans, mankind. Humankind, if you don't want it to be mankind. Um, and uh, and they are called to, by their creator, God, rule and subdue this earth, fill and multiply it, and be good stewards of it. They are challenged as to this task, you could say, by a choice they are given, which is in the form of a fruit tree, whether they will eat of the fruit of what's called the knowledge of good and evil or not. And then we get an introduction. So, so far, by the way, if you were reading the Bible, so far in the story, we have three main characters, God, uh, and then Adam and his wife Eve, or you could say we have two main characters, God and Adam, the humans. Uh, and then we're introduced to a third character, and the third character in the book is not a good character, right? Um, that's we're very clearly seeing that. And, and any good story has these components to it. And this is a good story. It's not just a good story. It's a great story. So, uh, so we're introduced to this creature. Creature that tells them the choice is simple. Take the fruit. It'll give you power and freedom to rule the world on your own terms. And so they seize this knowledge. And as a result, they become suspicious and self-protective. It leads to fractured relationships, violent power grabs, and ultimately a whole civilization, Babylon, that has redefined evil as good. And so God scatters this corrupted human project. And here the story of the Bible takes an important turn. We zoom in to the story of a man and a woman who come out of Babylon, Abraham and Sarah. Okay, this is very important because they skipped over a good chunk of the story. Um, right after the what's called the fall of man, right after sin, uh, the rebellion against God to say, no, we're going to run this by ourselves. We're going to rule it by ourselves. Thank you very much. You get the first murder when Cain and Abel have their issue or Cain has his issue, we could say. Um, and then we just continuously see human beings becoming more and more, let's say, corrupt and evil. The more we expand, the worse the issue becomes. What we also see is this place that gets established, and there's a reason they call it Babylon, right? This place that gets established where the human beings get together and they say, let us build a tower so that basically at the top of it, uh, you know, so we can reach the top, we can reach the gods or we can reach God and make a name for ourselves. And that's very important because it tells us the motivation of the human beings for this endeavor. And it is to make a, a name for themselves. That's why the Babylon or what we know as the Tower of Babel gets destroyed. And we also get the destruction, right? We, we get the flood story. And then now we're introduced to these two individuals that they're mentioning. Yeah, God promises that from them will come a new people, a nation that has another chance to make the right choice. And if they succeed, it will open up this new way forward for the rest of humanity. And this is why the rest of the Bible story is about this family. And it does not go well. 
Despite God's personal guidance, Abraham's family gives in to that same temptation to redefine good and evil on their own terms, apart from God. Even when their best people were in charge, rulers who loved God's guidance and had divine wisdom, even they gave in. And so Israel was warned by their own prophets that these choices would lead them back to Babylon, this time as conquered captives living in exile. And that's exactly what happened. That is a very interesting point because the story gets a certain kind of connection that uh, people don't notice. So Babel, right, uh, which again, we get this word Babylon from. Bab Babel is destroyed initially and then, but there's a reestablishment of a king, uh, multiple kingdoms, right? But the greatest, you could say, of these kingdoms is Babylon. And there's this continuous warning by the prophets, this foretelling, that if there's no repentance and change, and if people don't actually follow the God they're supposed to be following, um, do as he says, then they will be led captives into Babylon. Right? And that happens, not spiritually, or like, like that happens literally historically, they get led to, they get conquered and led to Babylon. So even with God's personal guidance, Israel fails. Who can succeed? Well, the prophet said that the story wasn't over. God's going to send a new leader to Israel to cover for their failures and to transform the people's hearts and minds so that they can make the right choice. And so the part of the Bible called the Old Testament ends and these promises are left hanging. And then the biblical story continues into the New Testament. So it's not, uh, the, the promise is always there, by the way. It's throughout the Bible. As a matter of fact, it's found in Genesis chapter 3 that uh, the serpent, uh, the, there will be enmity uh, between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And the serpent will strike the heel of the seed of the woman, but the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent or bruise the serpent's head. And so that's like you say the first time something like that's mentioned and then throughout the rest of the Bible things like this are mentioned. Specifically, a number of things like this are mentioned when it comes to King David. Uh, when it comes to King David, then the promise is given that his son or one of his sons will sit on the throne forever and rule it. We're introduced to a man who comes from the line of Israel's kings, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said that he was bringing all these promises to their completion. He confronted that dark, mysterious evil that all humanity has given into and resisted its power. And then he announced... Now that's good, okay, because uh, Adam and Eve do not resist and win over this, this character. Let's just call him the serpent, okay, because that's the, the serpent is introduced as the serpent. We see Israel in the desert for 40 years fall to temptation, rebel against God. We see kings and leaders like David fail and not be obedient to God. But when Jesus goes, and it's very interesting, right? Because Jesus, the, the first thing that the, the Gospels tell us, one of the first things, is that Jesus goes into the desert to be tempted by the devil. And now we get the devil, not introduced necessarily, but... Um, given more of a prominent role in the story. And you could say that temptation is both, uh, there's three temptations there. Uh, you, you could say the temptation is both uh, in the sense of what Adam and Eve went through and failed, but now Jesus has conquered. You could say being in the desert for 40 days, 40 nights is, is a uh, sort of representation of Israel being in the desert and failing, but now Jesus has uh, won in this, uh, in this challenge in the desert. God had arrived to rule the world through himself. Jesus taught about God's definition of good and evil, and he said that real power is serving others. According to Jesus, it's people who love the poor and even love their enemies. These are the kinds of people who actually rule the world. And that's confusing, but also really beautiful. And so is the claim that the story goes on to make about Jesus, that he is God become human, to be for Israel and for all humanity what we could never be for ourselves. He came to take the consequences of our evil into himself, and his sacrificial love proved more powerful than evil than even death itself. So now humanity's presented with a new choice. Represented by a new tree. Stick with the... Um, this is beautiful. I think the way they did this is really good. 
uh, is that the the tree you get in the garden is a tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil. It's got fruit on it, so on and so forth. The new tree, as you can see represented, right, is is a dead tree. It's a cut up tree, but it's uh, it's a tree that's used for crucifixions, and it's the one that Christ hung on. And here's the choice: like you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to follow God, incarnate God, become man, uh, the way God wants you to follow Him, or are you going to continue with the path uh, that humanity is already on? way of being human or venture into this new way. And in the story, those who choose the way of Jesus find themselves energized by God's own power. People who know that they are loved and forgiven by God can become people who love and forgive others in return. The Jesus movement quickly spread throughout the world, forming these new communities of people who follow the way of Jesus. But they faced problems. There was persecution from the outside by people in power, and inside there was confusion, even compromise. Yeah, because following Jesus is really hard. And so the movement's leaders, called apostles, they wrote letters to comfort and to challenge these communities to stay faithful to the difficult way of Jesus. And they're called to hope for the day when Jesus will come and change everything. And so the Bible ends by pointing to the future day when all wrongs are made right, when evil is eradicated, heaven and earth are united, and humanity can rule the world together in the love and power of God. So now now we get the story come full circle. And that's very important to understand that the the Bible is a story that is not disconnected, uh, but is a story that is coherent in its entire makeup, even though... It's got 66 books. It's got more than 40 authors it, uh, that span through like 1,500 years. There's a, there's a thematic connection in the text. And so what we get at the end is that human beings are called into this relationship, this rulership that God had est- originally established for humanity in the garden that humanity walked away from, or at least tried to do it their own way or our own way. And now the God of uh, the Bible, the, the God of the universe, the one who created the heavens and the earth, in the beginning, God said that there be light. That God is reestablishing these uh, humans to rule and reign with him as he had always intended. Okay, so that's the story of the Bible. And it brings all of these books together. But what's interesting is that each book contains a different kind of literature that contributes to this story in a unique way. And that's what the next video will begin to explore. So I'm not going to go into the next video, um, at least not now. But yeah, we will look at the different genres. Uh, I think this is a good resource to have for those who want to go and check it out more uh, the bible project videos a great resource for learning and teaching i highly recommend people using it for their uh, small groups and bible studies but uh, we will review them and as i have comments to make about it i will comment on it thanks for watching by the way appreciate it